Nothing that a few cable ties can't fix up. Cape York has to be one of the bucket list destinations for every four wheel driver and adventurer in Australia. So we've just got back from an awesome few weeks up in the Cape with our Land Cruiser 200 series towing our 3.2 ton lifestyle recon and in convoy with our good friends Dan and Anna in their Ford Ranger and Zone Caravan. Many of you would have read articles or probably seen lots of videos of convoys of four wheel drives that lifted and locked and loaded up with camping gear driving past that famous sign indicating the start of an awesome adventure and the start of the old telegraph track to head north to the tip of Cape York. But what about the rest of us? What about those of us who have these big heavy tourism tow trailers? Whether that be a box trailer to carry supplies, a camper trailer, a hybrid camper or even a full size caravan. Does the luxury of towing our caravan up to the tip mean that we sacrifice some of the fun and enjoyment had on that old telegraph track? This is how we made it to the most northerly point of the Australian mainland and back, towing a 3.2 tonne camper while also traversing the famous OTT along the way. Now this episode is covered by this disclaimer, and that is that I am not by any means an expert on Cape York. I don't pretend to be, nor do I think that I've even scratched the surface of this amazing area, which is definitely on my list of places to return to in the future. The purpose of this video is to help those who are planning their trip to the tip of Cape York, specifically those who are looking at towing along the way. We're going to cover a whole lot of frequently asked questions today, which is including some of the routes that you can take, the road and track conditions, the availability of fuel and water, where you can pick up supplies, mechanical support, and perhaps where you can stay or where you can leave your trailer if you do want to head out and hit the old telegraph track. So the advice or the adventure that I'm recounting today is based on our experience. And this includes the driving and road conditions, the timings and the weather. So we hit Cape York in June of 2023. And it also happened to unfortunately co coincide with the school holidays, which means that it's the peak of the busiest season for that region. Now we of course are a family of four with two young kids aged four and six years old and we were driving in our Toyota Land Cruiser 200 series towing our Lifestyle Recon R4T 3.2 tonne hybrid camper. Now in addition to this we were also travelling with good friends Dan and Anna and their two children aged four and two years old with their 2022 Ford Ranger and 2022 20 foot six full sized zone caravan. So to start up are the routes. What are your options if you want to head to the most northerly point of the Australian mainland? So our adventure started back in Cairns, like many people would traveling up from the east coast of Australia. Now the first decision you have to make when you leave Cairns is whether or not you want to go through or explore the Daintree rainforest. And if you do, are you ready and able to tackle the Bloomfield track? To get up through the Daintree Rainforest, you'll need to jump on the ferry that can take you and your trailer across the Daintree River. It's a relatively easy and cheap journey across, but it's like entering a new world. The scenery change, the greenery, the tight winding roads and trickling rivers nearby are a sight to see. I will point out that the roads are tight and windy, so you need to back off on that speed and just ensure that you're happy that you can stop in your own lane as far as you can see for any reason whatsoever. It's absolutely fine for full-size caravans, but when passing other large vehicles, you do have to be careful. So once you get through the Daintree Rainforest, you come to the south entrance of the Bloomfield Track. Now, the Bloomfield Track is highly debated on a lot of four-wheel drive forums because of those large warning signs they put at either end, recommending that the road is not suitable for trailers or caravans and asking those who are towing to turn around. Now I, as many people would be, were skeptical of these warning signs and the legitimacy of them. So with preparation being key, I left the trailer behind and headed up the track to see what it was like. Now don't get me wrong, I have no doubt that our vehicle and setup is more than capable of conquering the inclines and declines on that track, but it's not all about us. What I wanted to make sure of is that I wasn't going to be inconveniencing others on the track by selfishly driving the track with our caravan in tow, given those warning signs. 
but once we did head through, there were multiple places that you could easily pull over and allow traffic to pass in either direction, and most of the track was two-way optional anyway, so this wasn't a drama. Now, one important point about the Bloomfield track is to have your UHF turned on and tuned in to channel 40. It's important to do this, and it, there's signs along the way to prompt you to make sure they're on, but also to prompt you to call up ahead to some of the obstacles that you're about to traverse to let oncoming traffic know that you're coming up. It is unbelievable how many people have UHFs but tune them into their own private convoys and are completely unreachable outside of that. But please, make sure they're turned on and make sure they're tuned in to channel 40. Now, although I was very confident with our setup, these inclines aren't for the faint-hearted if you are towing. Now, some of the inclines there were up to 31%. Now, with a vehicle alone, that's not too much of a drummer, but when you're towing 3.2 ton, or in the case of the Ranger, 3.5 ton, you definitely know about it, particularly on the declines. So make sure everything is working as it should. Make sure your trailer brakes are on, working and turned up. Maybe use your gearbox to hold a lower gear and to give you the best chance of pulling up. And of course, be using low range. Now it should be noted that all of the steep inclines and declines do have a concrete base, so traction generally isn't an issue. But when you're towing heavy loads like we were, there was one particular incline I could just feel the front wheel start to lose traction. It's 100% load. A little bit of loss of traction on the front wheels. So something to be mindful of. But otherwise, take it easy, take it slow, and you should be right. Now it should also be noted that we were running slightly reduced tire pressures for this track at about the mid 30s, about 35 PSI all round, which does help for a little bit of traction and also for a bit of comfort too. The Bloomfield track is an absolutely amazing track. It consists mainly of hard packed dirt, but there are a few shallow river crossings that you will encounter and a couple of off camber four wheel drive obstacles, but nothing that requires any sort of special vehicle modification or any track building. There was only one instance for us that we had to reverse back about 100 meters just to allow an oncoming vehicle through, but otherwise it was quite simple and straightforward. Now another big topic that is thrown around with the Bloomfield track is insurance. Will you be covered if something happens on the track given those warning signs? And to be honest, it's not something that I can answer for you. You're better off checking with your particular insurer given your circumstances and your vehicle setup. I couldn't find anything about taking a caravan on this track that was in legislation. So although the signs say that it recommends or asks trailers and caravans to turn around, it does not necessarily mean that it's not lawful. Now once you've passed through the Bloomfield track and headed north, you'll be able to reward yourself with a beer and a hot meal at the Lion's Den Hotel. To give you a bit of reference in how long this drive took us, we left our accommodation south of the Daintree River and traveled all the way through the Daintree up the Bloomfield track, stopped for lunch at the Lion's Den Hotel, refueled in Cooktown and camped just north of Cooktown in a single day. And that was including filming with four young kids in tow between two vehicles. So it's a big day, but it's all well and truly doable. Now, of course, if you're not interested in tackling the Daintree Forest, or but in particular the Bloomfield track, there are a couple of options. Firstly, you can just park up at some of the accommodation like we did south of the Daintree River and do day trips into the area to explore it without your trailer in tow. The second option is the Kreb track. Now, this is a much harder track and is definitely not suitable for trailers or caravans, but unfortunately, this wasn't an option for us anyway, as it was closed due to wet conditions. Now secondly, the most popular bypass is to skip the area entirely, travel west on the Mulligan Highway and turn off directly onto the PDR or the Peninsula Development Road, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So once we had finished the Daintree and headed north of Cooktown, we made our way through the Lakefield National Park and through a road called Battle Camp Road. It consists of mainly hard packed dirt with a few rough sections and a couple of washouts along the way, but nothing that most vehicles and setups with trailers could not handle. Now just before Battle Camp Road meets back with the PDR, we turned right to head north on a station road up to Lilyvale Station and then through to Running Creek. Now of course being station properties, there are several gates that you do have to go through and of course the golden rule is to leave the gate how you found it. So if it's open, leave it open. If it's closed, make sure it's closed behind you. 
Now we came up to a private road between Running Creek Station and Port Stewart. Now on the maps it says that permits are required or that it's a private road, but we could not find any information about this before we started, other than speaking with some oncoming traffic, which said it was all accessible through to Cohen. So that we started off on this private track, which is where the road started to deteriorate and become a little bit more difficult. It does become quite narrow. There are several water crossings in place and some areas that become quite tight, particularly for full-size caravans. Now we did get the zone base 20 foot six through it, but as you can see, it was quite squeezy at certain sections and required a bit of run up on some of the exits to the river crossings. These track conditions, however, only lasted for that private road section between the station and Port Stewart. And once we started to head west back towards the PDR after reaching Port Stewart, the road opened up to another fairly well maintained gravel road. And this is where we decided to pull up for camp towards the end of this road before hitting the PDR. So again, for reference, we left that camp in Cooktown and made it to this lookout up here before the PDR near Cohen in a single day with quite a few regular breaks and a lot of filming. So the next day we headed to out to the PDR or the Peninsula Development Road and turned right to head north. And if you're heading to the tip of Australia, then there is no doubt at some point you're going to have to traverse at least part of this road. And this road consists of both sealed and unsealed sections, but we did find that the unsealed sections at the beginning of the school holidays in June 2023 were quite good and well maintained. And we were averaging speeds of anywhere between 70 and 90 kilometers an hour with our caravans in tow. Now, making your way north up the PDR, unless you're heading to the township of Weeper, you're going to be turning right onto the Telegraph Road. And this road is very similar to that of the PDR. It consists again of varied between sealed and unsealed sections, the vast majority of it being unsealed, but again, in very good condition. So for reference, we made it from our camp south of Cohen all the way through to Bramwell Station in a single day, again, at a very relaxed pace, setting up mid-afternoon for camp. This is when we start to enter the north section of Cape York. Bramwell Junction, which is about eight kilometers north of Bramwell Station, is where the official start of the old telegraph track begins. And this is where the four-wheel driving really begins if you're willing to take that route. But if you're towing a caravan or a large trailer, it's unlikely you're going to be dragging it up this track. So for the majority of us, we're going to be turning right to start heading northeast on the Bamiga Road. Now this road is just like the others, consists mostly of unsealed gravel parts with a few sealed sections in between. But we did find that the road wasn't in quite as good condition here, just given the nature of the curves and the slower pace and the amount of traffic that it receives. Now for perspective, the south section of the Bamaga Road from Bramwell Junction to the intersection of the old telegraph track took us about two hours to traverse with our caravans in tow. And the north section was even quicker than that again. We did find that the road got significantly worse and a lot more corrugated with about 10 to 15 kilometers leading up to the Jardine Ferry. Now this brings us on to the Jardine River. If you're heading to the tip of Cape York, you're going to have to cross this river and using the Jardine Ferry is your only option. It also has to be, in my opinion, one of the most expensive ferries in Australia given the distance you're crossing. It cost us with our vehicle and camper in tow $192 to cross in about 45 seconds, but I will mention that it does cover the return trip too. Now you used to be able to cross the Jardine River at the old tel at the end of the old telegraph track as well. However, they have closed that off. So the Jardine Ferry is now your only option. It also used to be the case that it was a cash only service. So you need to make sure you have that cash on you when you uh, arrive there. However, in 2023, that appears to be the other way around now. And it's an FPOS only service, which is somewhat handy. Now also you have to keep in mind the timings, particularly in peak seasons. We ended up getting there on the south side at about 8.30 a.m. and we didn't even have to stop the vehicle once we had our ticket. It was drive straight down, first in queue, rolled straight onto the ferry and across, no dramas. Heading back though, we heard people waiting up to an hour and a half, almost two hours to get back from the north section across to the south, given that small size of the ferry. For us personally, we left Bamiga quite early in the morning on our return trip, arrived at the ferry at 7.50, which is 10 minutes before its listed opening time, found that it was already running, and again, we were first in line, very little waiting time, and straight across. 
But once you are north of the Jardine Ferry, it's a quite a short and simple drive all the way to the top to Bamiga and through to the tip of Cape York. Now, of course, just because we're towing caravans or trailers doesn't mean that you get to miss out on some of the fun that the old Telegraph track or the OTT has to offer. Now, many people would have read articles or seen videos on this famous track, and it sure does offer a lot of four-wheel driving fun, some technical tracks, and several water crossings along the way. Now, there is no reason that you can't take a small trailer or a camper trailer down the entirety of the OTT. However, there is no doubt that it's going to slow you down and it will certainly add to some of the technical challenges that you'll face on some of those off-road obstacles. Before I get on to what we did personally, I think it's a good time now to remind yourself why you're exploring the Cape York region and what you're hoping to get from this area. The OTT can be a very difficult and dangerous track at times, and it has been the end of many four-wheel drives over the years, both prepared and novice. So if you're traveling around Australia and just want some interesting tracks, maybe it's a good time to set some boundaries as to what you will and won't do. Maybe it's the level of the water crossings or the depth of some of the washouts, or perhaps some of the entries into the creeks that would be very difficult to traverse in reverse without a lot of winching effort forcing you to push onwards. Whatever the case may be, just make sure you're prepared and know what your limits are. But if you're up in a tip to hit some of those hardcore four-wheel drive tracks, well, you're in paradise. Now for us, we left our camper back at Bramwell Station. We headed out the early the next day, about 7.30 a.m., traveled the eight kilometers north to Bramwell Junction, and were on the track first thing in the morning. And according to nearby campers, we were the first four-wheel drive vehicles through for the day. Now, of course, traversing the southern section of the OTT, we have several river crossings, including Palm Creek, Birdie Creek, the Dalhunty, Cockatoo, Gunshot, and a couple of others there that I've missed as well. But all of the track between the river crossings is not too difficult. It mainly consists of single lane track, some sandy, some gravel with the odd four wheel drive washout in between, but it really isn't that difficult. Now we completed the southern section of the OTT and we're at the intersection of the Bamaga Road by mid-afternoon. It only took us one and a half hours to retrace our steps back down the Bamaga Road and back to Bramwell Station with no campers in tow. So once we got back to camp, the next day we grabbed our campers, hooked them back up and dragged them back up that Bamaga Road again to the intersection of where the North OTT meets the road. Now, this area here has some gravel on either side, which is where a lot of people who have caravans or large trailers leave them unhooked and head in to both Fruitbat Falls, Elliott Falls and Twin Falls for day visits. And some people even camp here on the side of the road for an overnight stop. Now there are several gravel pits on this section of the Bamiga Road where you can pull over, set up camp and visit those areas for a couple of days. But I don't understand why everyone likes to camp right on that intersection. You are quite literally meters from a road, which is very, very, well, can be very, very busy and extremely dusty, which is definitely not gonna be suitable for the two of us driving with four kids in tow. So we drove another 10 kilometers north up the Bamiga Road found a gravel pit that was a little bit further off the road so we were out of the way of the dust and weren't visible by passing traffic. The first day while we were camped there we left the trailers behind and visited those falls I mentioned earlier and spent the whole day just relaxing and swimming in those creeks. The second day however we still left our campers at that gravel pit and started to head up the north section of the OTT, again experiencing some of the challenges and creek crossings that the track has to offer. Now I will say now that we didn't complete all the way to the end of the OTT, we missed a couple of creeks and the reasons as to why we did this will be in some of the future trip episodes. But this brings me on to some of the bypass or alternative options that you have while navigating any section of the track. Now some of the creek crossings have chicken tracks at the main crossing, but some, well, aren't so much of chicken tracks. Take Gunshot, for example. It's one of the most famous creek crossings on the old Telegraph track. Now, of course, you have the most difficult and steepest line, which is where a few people go, including myself, but then you have some of the chicken tracks at the creek. But to be honest, they're not exactly chicken tracks. They're still pretty full on, although not quite as big and intimidating as the main entrance they still get the heart pumping. But to get around Gunshot is a 26 kilometer diversion. So it's gonna take you off the track for quite some time. But there are other things, other creeks like Palm Creek, for example, where the chicken track is not too far away from the main drop off. But again, it's not exactly the easiest and most comfortable for some forward drivers. 
there are bypass tracks that come off the OTT and back to the Bamaga Road at certain points, and it's a good idea to know where these are. Some of the creek crossings like both Palm Creek and Mistake Creek, along with Gunshot, would prove very difficult to head back up in the south direction on the OTT. So once you've gone down into those creeks, you're committed for the next section or to wherever that next bypass road may be. <clears throat> now Mistake Creek this year had quite the drop off and once you were down there, it was a very unlikely chance you're going to make it back up again. If you drop down into the Mistake Creek, you're going to be doing Cannibal Creek, Cypress Bridge, and of course, Nolan's Brook. So just these things you need to be mindful of and make sure you know where those bypass routes are. We completed about 75% of the old Telegraph track and we did that in convoy with our friends in their Ford Ranger. This Ford Ranger was mostly stock. It only had rear airbags in the rear suspension, off-road tires, and a steel bull bar. It did not have a winch, side protection bar work, didn't have a lift kit or even a snorkel and it still did the parts of the track that we did just fine. What I came to realize is that a lot of the YouTube videos, articles and documentaries on this old Telegraph track definitely pick and choose some of the harder lines to make it look a little bit more difficult than it actually is. And don't get me wrong, there are still some obstacles that require a lot of attention and focus, but it's not quite as difficult and extreme as some people make it out to be. I'll also mention that if you're planning on doing this in dry season or peak season, there's a lot of other people out there sharing the track with you. So if worst came to worst, the odds are that some other people would be able to help you out. But this is not something that you want to rely on and you want to make sure that you're relatively self-sufficient, particularly with your own recovery gear. So you've decided to hit the OTT for yourself, just make sure you are prepared and ready to go the best you can be. And what I mean by this is, make sure before you head to the Cape York region, given its remoteness, that you've had your vehicle serviced and checked over, whether it's by yourself or by a reputable mechanic. But also check on the day that you're leaving to head out to the track as well. Do all the basic checks you can do, like checking your wheel nuts, checking for loose bolts, checking all your fluids, and everything that looks like it should. Corrugations, the trip just to get up to Brownwell Junction, are notorious for unwinding and unscrewing and dismantling your vehicle one bolt at a time. In fact, I lost three bolts off the underplates from the ARB bull bar. So it just goes to show even the checks sometimes don't cover it, but it's going to give you the best chance of making it to the top. Now it's also a good idea just to carry basic spares, just like you would on any other off-road or remote expedition. Things like belts and hoses, filters, particularly air filters in case you get your filters wet in the water crossings, but also basic tools and the knowledge on how to use them and to fit those spare parts if required. There's no point in having the tools and parts if you're unable or don't know how to fit them to your vehicle. And this brings me on to recovery gear. If you're planning on hitting the OTT, it is extremely important that you are carrying your own set of recovery gear for your vehicle and not relying on others on the track as that just wouldn't be fair. The absolute basics are a snap strap, some D shackles, and maybe even a bridle strap. But if you're carrying D shackles, make sure you've both got metal and the soft shackles as the soft shackles aren't always capable, you know, suitable for certain mounting types. And we're gonna to refer to all of this from here on in as the Ford recovery equipment. Tag it in there, mate. I'm happy for this to be the Ford recovery equipment right up to the point that it's not. And if that's the case, well, it can't be used on a Toyota, can it? If it's a Ford recovery equipment. I don't call it a Land we'll Cruiser for no reason. We're gonna leave it there. <laughs> but it's also very important that you have areas on your vehicle that this gear can be attached to. And what I mean by that is a rear recovery hitch or some sort of point on the back of your vehicle and very importantly, rated recovery points at the front. And the reason I say very important is there's no point in having the gear if you can't hook off the front of your vehicle or if you're hooking from those tow points that just aren't rated for that application. If someone else is gonna be pulling you out from, from the front and those parts come off, well, it's their vehicle that's going to get the damage. So I wouldn't be blaming them if they're not willing to help you out. Of course, if you have a winch, make sure you have the winch gear like the extension straps, tree trunk protectors, and winch snatch blocks or rings to go along with that gear too. Personally, given the depth of some of the river crossings and some of the misfortune I had in the Pilbara trip last year, I now also carry a water protection that goes around the front bull bar. This just helps create a bit of a bow wave as the front of your vehicle hits the water and also reduces the force that the water comes through your front grille and into your radiator and can prevent some of your fans going into the radiator and causing breakages. So just another piece of equipment that might be worth putting on the list. 
So regardless of which way you've made your way to the top, you're going to end up in the Bamaget area, Seisha area, or one of those towns up there for camping, as you can't camp right up at the tip. But to get there, it takes about 60 minutes from Bamiga. And the road is again a mixture of sealed and well-maintained unsealed stuff all the way up until the last portion. The last portion does narrow down into some single track, which is mostly hard packed dirt with a couple of water crossings, one which is about knee deep. So you've got to watch out a little bit there, but nothing that most SUVs and four wheel drives can't handle. Once you get into the car park, you do have a short walk of about 800 meters to get to that famous sign at the most northerly point of the Australian mainland. You can opt to go straight over the rocks or at low tide around the beach as well. Once down there, obviously you need to get that obligatory famous photo of you, your convoy and your family with that sign. But we found going early morning to mid morning was the best time as once we were leaving, cars were pouring in and no doubt the wait for that photo without other people interrupting it would have been much longer than we had to stand around for. So we had finished the tip by late morning. We headed back down and were able to head onto the eastern side of the Cape York Peninsula. And that was where we did the five beaches four wheel drive. It's nothing too difficult, lowered tire pressures, and it is very easy. An interesting drive, it didn't take any more than about an hour and a half. So once we were back from that loop, we visited the croc tent to pick up some of the uh, official Cape York merchandise and made our way back down to camp for mid afternoon. So we managed to do that whole top section in less than a day. But a few days up at the tip would be ideal. There's plenty to see, plenty of communities and little townships to explore. And you've also got some World War II wreckage as well out there, which is really, really interesting as well. So definitely plan for at least a few nights up there to check out the entire area. So moving on to tire pressures, they play a huge part in traversing some of the areas around Cape York. And it's going to be different for everybody, but not only does it help the comfort of the passengers inside the car, also eases up some of the corrugation or the harshness of those corrugations on your vehicle and has a little bit more mechanical sympathy, but also helps the road conditions a little bit too. Now, everyone's going to be a little bit different depending on their setup, how many axles they're towing, how much they weigh and their wheelbase. But for us, the rule of thumb was once we hit those corrugated unsealed roads, our whole setup was down to 30 PSI as a starting point. And we found this actually worked quite well for the majority of our time spent in the region, both for the unsealed sections and the short intermediate periods of sealed road too. Saying that, when we hit the old telegraph track, the tire pressures came right down on the vehicle. Now I started all the way down at 15 PSI, which does sound quite low, but it came in really handy for maximum traction, particularly on some of the sandy based river crossings, but also gave some flex in the tire side wall when hitting some of the roots and rocks on the side of the track as well. And I'm happy to say that I made it through without any punctures on any tires of my combination. Now I did touch on communication a little earlier, but I cannot stress enough that the UHF Channel 40 is one of your biggest friends while traversing this area. There's a lot of traffic up there in peak season and it is an incredibly dusty environment. I think I used my UHF more in the few weeks we're in Cape York than in the combined seven months that we've been on the road. And it was extremely helpful, not only for me, but for others who were trying to get around me or pass me at the same time. Now, most of us who tow caravans or camper trailers completely understand that First of all, we can kick up a lot more dust than single vehicles, and generally, we're slower than other single vehicles on the road. We know this, but we also can't see behind us through that dust cloud. And if you're wanting to try and overtake one of us, the best way to do that is on channel 40. There were some instances where people were just flying past us blindly on corners with oncoming traffic, and it was just downright dangerous, which all could have been avoided by using channel 40, which would have made me aware that people were behind us. We could have pulled over, slowed down, and let them through. It also helps incredibly when you have oncoming vehicles or a convoy coming towards your convoy, and you can talk to each other to let them know how many vehicles to expect, particularly around some of the tighter corners. But if there's only one thing you get from today's video, if there's only one thing you take away, is please get a UHF, make sure it's on, and use channel 40. I understand that we also use them for our private chats in our own convoy, but if you're going to do that, try and purchase a second radio for that purpose and still have a primary radio on channel 40 to contact others, but more importantly, for others to contact you. It really could end up saving your life. 
Moving on to water availability in the Cape. Now, we filled up in cans before we left and we have quite a large water supply in both the vehicle and the camper. We then filled up again at the Daintree accommodation we were at and this was perfect for drinking water and lasted us until we got to Bramwell Station. Now Bramwell Station, they said it was the water was absolutely fine to drink, it was spring water, but I have a feeling that spring water might have been a fancy way of saying bore water. Regardless, we still drank it anyway. Yes, it tasted a little bit different, but hey, we're all still here and we're all still healthy, so it, it's obviously not harmful but we did get told to fill up our drinking water tanks at Brownwell as a last option. Moving forward from there, particularly at the Cape, there are signs saying that the water is potentially contaminated and it's not advised to drink. So therefore, we only drank the water from Brownwell Station and carried that all the way to tip and back again in both the vehicle and the camper. While up there though, we used our secondary tanks, which are separated for all of our general water usage, which was fine at running through the water that was supplied at our accommodation. But if you are, a little bit uh, picky about the water that you drink, then perhaps you might want to budget on buying a bottled water or taking fresh water with you up to the top. Moving on to shops and supplies in the Cape. Now for us personally, we did a huge stock up back in cans before we left and primarily are non-perishable. So all of our pantry items and we also bought a lot of our meat and put them in our 65 litre Waco in the back of the cruiser, which was turned into a freezer for this portion of the trip. Now I was pleasantly surprised that you can actually get quite a bit at the tip in terms of shopping and supplies, but it was going to be more expensive. So we probably did save some money by doing quite a large bulk shop before we left. As being said, there were a few supplies at Cohen, very little supply at Bramwell Junction, and then moving up to the tip at Bamiga and Surrounds, they, each of the communities have a small supermarket, which we found to be fairly well stocked, both of your non-perishables and plenty of fresh fruit and veg as well. Granted, just that little bit more expensive. So we did use those supermarkets to buy all of our fresh produce a couple of times while we we're up there. But again, if you do have the option to stock up and take some of that stuff with you, it probably would be a little more cost effective. But you don't have to worry or get nervous about running out of food. There's plenty up there, plenty of options. So fuel, I was pleasantly surprised again about just how accessible and frequent the fuel stops were in the Cape. And we did not have to worry about that whatsoever. Personally, I do keep the fuel tanks on the cruiser quite full. So you just never know if you're going to be turning off to take an alternative route, whether you might get stuck or worst case scenario, even lost. But fuel was readily available throughout our trip. We ended up filling up at Cooktown before we hit, headed up the, the Lakefield National Park, again in Cohen. And then Bramwell Junction, we did require a bit. It is quite a bit more expensive at Bramwell Junction. And with the limited space around the Bowsers, there's also quite a wait time in the mornings, particularly those for heading out to the OTT. Up the top though in Bamiga, there are quite a few fuel stations in the communities. Again, all very accessible at a reasonable price. When I say reasonable, it's going to be a fair bit more expensive than the cities along the east coast of Australia, but it's all accessible. There's also plenty of fuel at Laura, Harn River, Musgrave, Archer Roadhouse, and at the Jardine Ferry coming up the PDR Bamiga Road. So you really don't have to worry about your fuel range. So moving on to accommodation. Now, like I mentioned, we visited in the school holidays and we were told by numerous people that you have to book accommodation prior to getting up there because everything just books out. The campsites are flooded. And I can tell you that we booked nothing. We didn't organize any of our accommodation prior to getting up there and we were absolutely fine. There was plenty of space and there was no stressing. So as I mentioned, we camped roadside leading up to Cohen and then we made our way to Bramwell Station. We didn't book here, we just rocked up along with pretty much everybody else. You pay your nightly fee, you find some open area out in the grass and you have access to the water taps which are dotted all around the sites and this worked just perfectly for us for a few nights. We then moved up to the gravel pit, just 10 kilometers north of the intersection at Fruit Bat Falls. We had that area to ourselves for a few nights. Obviously, you're not booking for a gravel pit. And then we moved up to the tip at, uh, to a small campground called, I think it's pronounced Alau. I'm sorry if I got that incorrect. This particular, sort of like a caravan park, but you can't make bookings. It's just first in best dress. So we rocked up about mid-morning, so fairly early as a couple of campers were leaving. We asked for a powered site. We were very lucky enough to get a powered site that faced out towards the coastline, which was really, really awesome. Once you had that site, you can pay for as many nights as you want. It's not going to be taken by the next person coming in because there are no bookings. We did find that it did get quite busy towards the end of the day, but 
there was a very high turnover rate. So as frequently as people would come in, the next day they would all leave again. So if you get there any time between mid-morning and sort of early to mid-afternoon, you have a pretty good chance at getting a reasonable sight. Any later than that, you might be shunned towards the back of the campground. But this campground and another campground called Loyalty Beach both worked on that same principle of turn up and pay once you get there. So there was plenty of opportunity up there. But if you did want something a little bit fancier, something like Punson Bay, then you would have to book us. This was booked out for about a month or six weeks in advance prior to us getting there. Of course, you're a little bit closer to the tip at Punson Bay and you also have the restaurant and bar as part of the caravan park. So it just depends on what you need. Now, I will mention that the campgrounds that we stayed at, they did have power, but there were only two power ports per uh, distribution hub. And there were a lot more campers in that area than two. So we did have to share the power around, but that wasn't an issue for us as we just relied on our batteries and our inverters while someone else was charging up their camper trailer. So just something to keep in mind. So there's always the discussion of security, primarily theft in these areas, particularly at right up the top. Now, if you're a member of any of the four-wheel drive forums, all the forums that uh, discuss some of the travels around Cape York, you might think that theft is prevalent and it's everywhere. And I don't think this is quite the case. Don't get me wrong, I know theft is up there and it's quite a high rate given the size of the communities. However, it's not the war zone that it's painted out to be. I think the biggest piece of advice is be aware, be alert, and simply pack away your valuables and lock up your setups. There's no doubt that by removing some of the high value items out of sight from people who may wanna take it, is definitely going to reduce your chance of being a victim of crime quite substantially. Now don't get me wrong, if someone wants something that you have, they're going to get it. But if you can make it harder for them, why not? It's just going to push them on to the next campsite. And to be honest, with the amount of valuables and items that I saw laying around at camp without vehicles present or throughout the night, it's no wonder that some of these items go missing. I'm not blaming the victims, but at least try and make it a little bit harder for people and you might have a better chance of getting out with all of your gear still in your combination. So recoveries and repairs. How remote is the Cape and how difficult is it to repair or recover your vehicle if the worst were to happen? Well, look, the services are out there, but I think you need to be prepared or at least have the backing behind you to pay for it if absolutely necessary. Now, of course, one of the most remote areas of the Cape is going to be the old telegraph track. If your vehicle comes to a dead stop in the middle of that, it's going to be quite difficult and quite expensive to remove it from there. But minor repairs or repairs that need doing on the way can be done. Now, stations like Bramwell Station, some of the other working stations along the way, might be able to assist depending on your issue, but keeping in mind that's not their primary business. It's not in their interest to get you back on your trip. So they might be able to help you, but don't rely on them as a last resort. Some of the towns though, like Cohen and Bamiga, do have mechanics, but again, in peak season, they're going to be busy. There are a lot of cars breaking down up there. They're going to be flooded with inquiries and repairs along the way. So it might be something you have to wait for. Now, worst comes to worst, if your vehicle does break down and it's not going anywhere from the top, you can elect to put your vehicle on a ship and get it shipped back down to Cairns. But from the rumors going around, we're looking at about $5,000 to do that. So you really don't want your vehicle stopping up the top. And again, this comes into consideration when deciding whether or not to do the old telegraph track. We saw quite a few vehicles that were not moving under their own steam while we're traveling around. And even one had filled up their petrol tank and driven with petrol in a diesel engine. So it obviously caused some pretty catastrophic damage to the engine. Something very simple to do, but it's gonna be a very costly mistake. You can rest assured the services are out there. You do have tilt trays, you do have towing services from the OTT with numbers provided on the track. How you call them, I'm not sure because you have no reception, but there are services out there that can get you out. So you're not gonna be stranded. You're not gonna perish out there with your vehicle. Just be prepared, know what you're getting into, and take risks accordingly. Now in the end, I don't think you need a huge expensive setup, a lifted and locked four wheel drives running 35 or 37 inch tires with massive raised airing takes to do the cape. The, the road between Cairns and Bamiga at the top, well, it's just that, it's a road. Granted, there are corrugations and large portions of unsealed road, but it is a road nonetheless. And on our travels, we saw Toyota Corollas heading up towards the Jardine Ferry. We saw Captivas pulling caravans. I mean, you don't need anything too fancy if you drive to the conditions. 
This being said, if you're towing a trailer, an off-road trailer or at least an all-road trailer is definitely going to be a huge advantage, particularly with the dust. Can't tell you enough just how dusty this area is. We were really lucky with our Lifestyle Recon that it has a dust suppression system, so we didn't have that issue, but a lot of the other caravans and campers we saw were using duct tape and cardboard and other tricks to sort of patch up some of the vents and holes in their vans just to prevent or at least reduce some of that dust ingress. Now on the maps, the Cape area looks quite large and it's hard to gauge just how long it will take you to get from point A to point B, but I'll give you this as a bit of a reference. On our way back down, we left Bamiga right up the top end at 7.15 a.m. We came down, we crossed the Jardine Ferry, we came down the Bamiga Road, down the Telegraph Road, and quite a large chunk of the PDR, all the way down to Artemis Station, which is almost near Cooktown. We arrived there at 4.30 p.m. So it was a big driving day, but keeping in mind, we were taking regular breaks, we stopped for fuel in Cohen, and we still had four kids on board between our two cars. So. Although it was a big day, it wasn't something that was unachievable. It gives you a bit of an idea about just how much ground you can cover if you just want to drive for a single day. Now, another question I have been asked a few times is would I take the Lifestyle Recon down the old Telegraph track? And the simple answer is hard and fast, it's definitely a no. The reason for that is it's not because it's not capable. I have no doubt that if you really tried, you could get a camper like this down the OTT, but the question that I was wondering would be why? It, you just don't need to. I think taking a trailer down this would not only risk more damage to both your vehicle and your trailer, but make the tracks that much harder to traverse. There were quite a few obstacles where there were a lot of tight turns, a lot of uh, undulating terrain where it would have been hung up on the drawbar, and it just would have made life a lot more difficult, and it would have slowed our progress down significantly. If you just wanna go out and have some four-wheel driving fun, the best way to do that is with the vehicle by itself. And given the fact that the biggest section, which is the south section of the OTT, can be traversed in a day if there are no problems, there's just no need to take a camper that big down the track. So yes, I think it's capable. Would I take it? No, I wouldn't. In conclusion, Cape York is very doable. Whether or not you're a single vehicle, you have a cheap road car, you have a lifted and locked four-wheel drive, or you're towing a full-size 22-foot caravan, it is doable and should not be intimidating. Driving to the right conditions, having the right gear, having backup gear and emergency food and water, just in the rare case you were to get stuck in remote areas is always a good idea. Lowering your tire pressures, driving slowly over rough terrain, and using channel 40 on the UHF will make your trip not only a lot more comfortable, safer, but a lot easier as well. If you're gonna be taking tracks like the OTT, a bit of experience, knowledge, patience, and walking the lines first is a big help when traversing some of the harder obstacles and will go a long way, particularly in some of the water crossings, because some of them are a lot deeper than they look to the eye. Now, it should be noted that the road conditions can change frequently, quickly, and change every single year after a wet season. The roads can be washed away, and depending on the, the volume of traffic traversing the area will depend on the level of corrugations and how badly these roads deteriorate over a period of time. But if you're interested about seeing the road conditions before you head up there, potentially call some of the local businesses or some of the agencies up there that might be able to give you a bit of a heads up as to what to expect, or otherwise join some of the Facebook and other four-wheel drive type forums on the area who can normally give you up-to-date information after regular visits. But I hope today's episode has been helpful, at least in trying to plan what could be the trip of a lifetime up to the Cape. And Rest assured that regardless of what setup you have, you don't need to spend big and you certainly don't have to have a full off-road camper trailer to head up to the Cape and to the most northern point of the Australian mainland. This time that we've had in the last few weeks traversing this region has been one of the most adventurous and most fulfilling journeys that we've had on our trip so far. It really is a mecca for the four-wheel driver and adventurer, and I'd highly recommend it to anybody who's traveling around Australia, but anybody who has a four-wheel drive and just wants to go out for a few weeks and really explore and feel what it's like to be out in the Australian bush, particularly with a lot of other like-minded people. But I hope you've got some value from today's video. And whether or not we see you up at the top of Cape York or somewhere else around our amazing country, we'll make sure to see you next time on Exploring Oz. Cheers.
Go on that way first. 